Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I've been looking at the W65C265SXB development board by Western Design Center. This board is built around their 65265 microcontroller, which itself is based on the 65C816 microprocessor, which is a 16-bit extension of the classic 8-bit processor, the 6502. The 65816 is probably best known for being the core of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super NES, or SNES as some people call it, and the Apple II GS. The development board has these pins here coming out that have various signals on them, and I thought we might be able to do an Arduino-style thing where we could stack expansion boards on top of this and keep stacking various boards to add various features. And here I'm going to talk about adding game controllers. I already did a video where I started to try to plan out how we might connect various devices to the 65C265SXB development board. And here I'm going to focus in on the controller. So I put together a template in Eagle for the layout of the pinout of the development board. Up here we have the tone generator outputs. This is something that WDC calls the X bus. And then I have connectors J3, J4, and J5 that correspond to various bits of I.O. One could create boards that would connect to SNES or NES style controllers. Here I'm going to focus on the Sega Genesis format that uses this fairly standard DB9 connector. So this will also be compatible with controllers for the Sega Master System. And if you're okay with just one button, you could also use Atari 2600 style controllers. Now, the controller for the Sega Genesis has more buttons than we have pins for on this nine pin controller. And essentially there's a select pin that carries a logical signal from the console that goes to the controller. And that select signal is input to a multiplexer chip that if the select signal is ground, produces the signals over here shown on the left. And if the select signal is high, then it produces the signal shown on the right. Now it's a bit interesting that pins three and four both produce ground if the select signal is low. Notice that corresponds to the left and right button, and a player can't press both of those at the same time. So this gives the console a way to read the controller and tell if it's actually a Genesis-style controller or one of these older Sega Master System-style controllers that is basically the layout on the right. So the older Sega Master System controller had up, down, left, right, and then two buttons. And then the Genesis add a third main play button and a start button. Now this is for the three button controller version of the Sega Genesis controller. There is a six button version that's a lot more complicated. It's not just a multiplexer. Basically the console has to toggle the select line in different patterns to put the controller in different modes. So the controller will produce different data for the additional buttons. Now, the setup that I'm going to describe here should also accommodate that, but I'm not going to worry about the exact business of what's involved in the six button protocol here. So this is a pinout description for the development board. And this is something I developed in the previous video. And when I set this up, I originally thought, okay, well, we'll need to take a couple of these GPIO pins, set them as outputs, and we'll need one for the select signal for each controller. But then I realized, well, we're really only going to be reading from one controller at any particular moment. So I really don't need two of these. I'll write something like controller select. So this is for the uh, Sega controller here. That's the select output. We could have one of those for both controllers. Oh, and I should say I'm going to set this up so we can, in fact, have two controllers plugged in and potentially four if you wanted to stack two of these boards. I've set up the ability to do that. So remember this P51 DSRB0. And we also have a chip select output, this CS0B. So B stands for bar, which means this is an active low signal. 
So remember P70 slash CS0B chip select. That's going to select this controller board. Now, I've also set this up to be a little pickier than I had previously. Previously, I said, okay, well, we'll just use this for controllers, but we do have some additional address pins to use here, and we might want to put some other I.O. So I've actually changed this a little bit. We'll get back to that. So going back to the board layout here, something that's a little bit complicated is that the plus five power supply and ground is available in a whole bunch of places on the board. It's available at each of these connectors, J3, J4, and J5 on pins one and two. It's also available at the end pins, at the end pins on both sides of this big X bus connector, J1. And it's also available on the tone connector. Oh, I actually forgot about that. I don't think that would have helped me in the layout though. Anyway, I have different symbols for VDD, which is the plus five volts, and VSS, which is ground, for the different places where it appears on the board. So here, for instance, I have VDD three, four, and five. And for that X bus connector, I have VDD X one for pin one and VDD X 49 for pin 49, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this makes doing the schematic entry and layout a bit complicated. But I didn't want Eagle to complain that I wasn't explicitly connecting VDD3 here with VDD4, which it would do if I just called those both VDD. It would put an air wire between them. And there's probably a way to tell it to be happy with that air wire, but I wanted to avoid having to think about that. So I did call these different things, which leads to some confusion later when you'll see on my main schematic Instead of just having one ground for everything, I have different grounds that are labeled slightly differently depending on what was closest, for instance. Here I have the layout of the board in Eagle, or I should say the current draft of the board. Here's the schematic. So walking through this, here I have all of the various original connections. I'm making extensive use of the fact that you can label various nets in Eagle and if they have the same label, it will connect those without having to actually draw a line between them. So here I have the two DB9 connectors for the two Sega style controllers. We have up, down, left, right, button B and button C. And I label these according to one of the select signal settings. And the other setting, I think left and right are ground and then you can get the other button, including the select button on the other setting. And then I have the same setup of buttons down here and joystick directions. And I just added a one or a two to indicate the appropriate controller. And we also have VDD, which is five volts and VSS is ground. So you'd always need VSS hooked to ground here even if you're using an Atari 2600 style, very simple joystick. The VDD, this plus five volts, that's only needed for a Sega Genesis style controller. The three button one has a multiplexer chip that needs power. And the six button one has some sort of much more complicated circuitry that also needs power. A Sega Master System style controller doesn't actually need this. Now, you notice that I use different VDDs. Here I'm using VDD X50 from the X bus connector. Here I'm using VDD3 from J3. It's just whatever was closest and most convenient. Similarly, I'm using two different VSSs here. Now, if you're using a Sega Genesis controller, we wouldn't actually need these pull-up resistors because the output of a Sega Genesis controller is being driven by some sort of logic chip of some sort, and that doesn't need pull-up resistors. But if you're using an Atari 2600 style joystick or a Sega Master System style controller, those are gonna need some pull-up resistances. So here I have 10K pull-up resistors. I pick those for no particular reason. I mean, in terms of picking the 10K value, I didn't have any particular reason other than that's a common value. And those are then pulling up to five volts. And especially for the controller number one, depending on where we're at, different plus five sources were more convenient. 
for the second controller, I picked everything from the same plus five volt source. It just depended on what made the layout easiest. So on an Atari 2600 joystick or Sega Master System controller, essentially what happens is that all of these various inputs, if you're not pressing down a button, basically the console sees five volts through these 10K resistors. The console, or in our case, our development board, has high impedance inputs. Once you press a button, basically what that button does is it will take that particular input line and short it to ground. So that's why you always need this ground connection. So like most buttons for arcade machines, a high logic value indicates the button's not being pressed, and a low logic value indicates that it is being pressed. Now, where does this all go? The up, down, left, right, and the buttons, again, I'm only listing for one of the select states. In the other select state, you'll get different buttons here, but I'm only showing it for one of them to simplify the notation here. Well, we're going to take all of those results from the joystick and input those data values into this 74573 octal transparent latch. And I'm really using the 573 for its tri-state output capability. I'm not really using it as a latch. What's labeled as OC in this eagle symbol, most of the data sheets I've seen actually call this OE output enable. And this is an active low signal as indicated by the little circle you see here or by the bar you see over OE here. Basically what this means is that if this output enable input is high, then all of these Q outputs are disconnected entirely. The chip just lets go of these data lines. If the output enable line is asserted low, that means that these are indeed connected and what's happening on the left, what's going on on the left here, is being passed through on the right. And it's important to have chips like this, especially in a situation where you have multiple things that might be wanting to write to the data bus. So here I have two controllers. I can't just hook the outputs here together and have them both driving the data lines at the same time. And in particular, the microprocessor itself might want to be writing stuff to memory. Other things might want to be writing to the data lines, other peripherals in the system. So things have to know how to take turns and we need to coordinate that. So. In this particular case, we'll set this up so that we'll have some address logic decoding here so that only one of these is active at once. And we'll have to set up our entire system so that when one of these is active and writing to the data lines for the microprocessor to read, nobody else is trying to write to the data lines either, including the microprocessor. Now, I just said something a little bit incomplete. I said that when this is asserted low, then what's happening at the input is being passed through the output. That's when this latch is in transparent mode. And that happens when this C input here, this pin 11, which the data sheet actually calls LE, is high. So when this LE line is high, the data at the inputs enter the latches and then are passed through to the other side. And however this changes on the left, you'll see the change on the right. Now, if the LE line goes low, it will latch that information, it will store it kind of in a little set of registers here, although you really think of D flip-flops as registers, but you get the idea. Once that line goes low, then it will be held at a particular value coming in until this line here, this C line, they call it on the eagle part. The data sheet calls it LE. I don't know why they're calling it C here. Anyway, <laughs> when it goes back high and then it will become transparent again, it let is what on the left go through to the right. And again, when I say what's on the left goes through to the right, that assumes that the output enable is asserted and that's done by pulling this low. So I have this just tied high. So whatever is on the left is going to the right. I'm not doing some sort of complicated high-speed digital communications protocol where I need to latch this information at certain points in some sort of bus cycle or whatever. So I do that. Let's see. I tie these high just because it's not a good idea to leave inputs disconnected. And 
the VDD sort of signal, the plus, it's not really signal, it's just plus five volts. That was convenient on the PCB. I could have just as easily had tied them low. It wouldn't matter. I also thought about using these for some other inputs, maybe some other buttons that we could add somewhere, but I was running low on space on the PCB and just wanted to move on. Anyway, let's talk about the address decoding logic here. So, down here we have a 74138 decoder chip, and this is set up to drive chips that have chip select inputs that are active low. So the active low outputs are indicated here by these little circles. And basically, under some conditions, if the various pins here, this G1, G2A, G2B, aren't in the right configuration, then all of these are going to be set high and none of them are going to be activated. If these are correct, namely G1 is set high and G2A and G2B are set low, then this chip itself is active and one of these outputs is going to be asserted by being pulled low by the chip depending on what the number we see in this binary input and these ABC pins. So let's see what we're putting into it. Notice I'm not putting an A2. So in order to read from the joystick ports, it doesn't really matter what is in bit two of the address space. So we have a little bit of aliasing there and we're losing some potential IO spots, but I'm not gonna worry about that. We're not losing much. So notice that I'm not using outputs four, five, six, seven. So if A3 is asserted high, then we would wind up using one of these outputs, which aren't hooked to anything anyway. So we know that A3 needs to be set low to be able to read from here. A4 also needs to be set low. Now we also have this chip select, chip select 0B, and basically that incorporates A5 all the way up. This chip select 0B is only going to be low, it's only going to be asserted low when we're accessing certain ranges. And the particular range we have only gives us freedom from A0 through A4, only five bits, 32 memory locations anyway. So CS0B, that needs to be low. A4 also needs to be low. A3 needs to be low. So basically, we're limiting the number of addresses we can write here. Now, what about RWB? This is the read-write signal coming from the microprocessor. So this is read-write-bar. So when this is high, RWB is high, then we're reading from memory or I.O. And when it's low, then we're writing. So I attached RWB to this G1 input so that we're only activating one of these chips. We're only activating its outputs if the processor is in read mode. If the processor is trying to write, then these won't be active. Now, theoretically, if the programmers promise to be good, we could ask them to only read from the memory locations associated with this I.O. and never write to it, but some programmer may write to it somewhere and we want to avoid having the processor and these 573s both trying to write to the data lines at once. So what's going on with A0, A1 and these jumpers? Remember I said that I have boards that can handle two joysticks, but I wanted to potentially be able to stack two boards on top of each other to handle four joysticks. So in the main configuration, we have joystick one and joystick two. And basically you'd select between joystick one and two, depending on the bit coming into A0 here. And for these jumpers, those correspond to basically three pin header spots on the board. And taking a look at the board here, we can see those jumpers. And here I actually put in a label one, two, and three, four, one, two, three, four, to show the user about where they need to jump, depending on what configuration they want the board to work in. Now, what about the HC in the middle here? So I've picked the HC Logic Series 74HC. This is a CMOS kind of process. 
compared with a BJT style process that was used in the original 74 series logic. The other kind of 74 series logic you'll see a lot of is the 74 LS series. That's the original transistor transistor logic, TTL logic that uses BJT transistors. Now it turns out that the 74 LS and 74 HC logic families are not entirely compatible in terms of what voltages represent various logic levels and what is guaranteed. So they're generally not compatible. Nowadays, I find that the HC parts tend to be more available and they seem to also be lower power. And the C in 65C265 indicates CMOS. So yeah, let's go with the 74 HC series. So when I'm using Eagle, I like to use the oddly named invoke command on my chips in order to expose the power pins explicitly. So here we have the power pins for my three chips. And you can see that I've included a 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor for each chip. And if you look at the board itself, you can see that I have the decoder chip over here near the address bus, which you might expect. And then I have the 573 chips next to the DB9 ports, which you might expect, and that I have the various bypass capacitors next to the power pins of the various chips as they should be. And again, which particular plus five source I used and which particular ground I used depended on what made the layout most convenient. Notice I wrote 0.1 microfarads as 0U1 instead of 0.1U. The reason I did that is that by using the letter of the unit scale here instead of the decimal point, that helps deal with issues in general where a decimal point might get lost in, say, some kind of photocopying process. So if I need a 4.7K resistor, I'll instead write that as 4K7. Now, when I'm doing PCB layout, I prefer to do it, quote unquote, by hand, meaning I don't like to use the auto router. Now, I'm laying out fairly simple two layer boards. And if I were to be laying out something more complicated, I would probably start wanting to use automated tools. The main thing I found is that if I'm laying out things by hand, then it forces me to think about the placement of the parts in a way that the auto router might not lead me to. I also like to not have push obstacles or walk around obstacles turned on. I like to have ignore obstacles turned on and force myself to think about those obstacles. And maybe I want to push parts to different positions in order to make the layout easier. And I also tend to like to avoid vias. Now, I certainly use them as I use them here. This seemed like a nice place to use them. Now, when I'm doing PCB layout, I prefer to do it, quote unquote, by hand, meaning I don't like to use the auto router. Now, I'm laying out fairly simple two layer boards. And if I were to be laying out something more complicated, I would probably start wanting to use automated tools. The main thing I found is that if I'm laying out things by hand, then it forces me to think about the placement of the parts in a way that the auto router might not lead me to. I also like to not have push obstacles or walk around obstacles turned on. I like to have ignore obstacles turned on and force myself to think about those obstacles. And maybe I want to push parts to different positions in order to make the layout easier. And I also tend to like to avoid vias. Now, I certainly use them as I use them here. This seemed like a nice place to use them because I have the data lines coming in horizontally here and they need to connect vertically here. And they're sort of in this alternating staggered pattern where there's no way to really set this up without having things crossed over. But in general, I try to avoid vias because I always put myself in the position of somebody debugging the board and that person is often me. And if a signal is constantly switching sides of the board, back and forth and you have to kind of flip the board over to see where a signal is going, that can become confusing. So I like to avoid vias so I can look at a trace on the board, see where it's connected, see where it's connected to, and be able to follow it without a whole lot of trouble.
Before I get this fabricated, I'm probably going to have one of my vertically integrated project students in my retro futuristic hardware team breadboard a simplified version of this and try to get it working because there's something I'm not sure about. There's a Phi 2 clock that's available on the XBus, and basically the processor is setting up address lines while it's low, and the actual reading and writing takes place when it's high and dropping back to low. It's not really obvious from the timing diagrams here, but I think the read takes place here and the write takes place here, and You'll often see places in schematics where people have various chip selects or whatever that are gated with this V2 in certain ways. And that's definitely the case for writes. Apparently, it's important to have the write be taking place at the correct time or the address may not be fully set up and that can create problems. It's apparently less critical on the read I don't think we need to do that here because it's a user input. The change from button press to not button press is not super critical relative to the clock speeds of the processor in terms of what the human is doing relative to that processor speed. What makes me nervous is that if you look at the schematic for the development board, the various write enables and read enables associated with the RAM chip are both gated by V2, not just the writes, the reads are gated as well. But RAM chips can have more complicated timing requirements than just the simple output enable on a 573 that we're using here. For instance, in the RAM chip on the 265SXB development board, there is a chip select input that has to go low before the write or reads are strobed. So I think we could test this on the breadboard with just one of the 573s, so just one joystick input. And also we could test it without actually using the full controller. We could just use one of the buttons, say the up button, test bit one or something like that, where we just plug a button and a 10K resistor into the breadboard and don't bother with the DB9 connector. So let's see where everything lands on the memory map. I had previously thought let's make pin 4 on chip select 0 be the controller select, but we really have that now being address 0. And we also need address 3 and address 4 to be 0. So I'll say for C0 is asserted and A3 equals 0, A4 equals 0. And actually, we should say A0, A1 indicates the selected controller, where A1 equals 1 would be controller 3 and controller 4, and A1 equals 0 would be controller 1 and controller 2. Okay, so if we take a look at our memory map, we would have DF00 to DF03 corresponding to the controller one through four inputs. And this would be aliased at what we would get from setting pin two high in terms of the address pins, because I don't use that at all. So this would actually be aliased at four above that. So we could also, if for some reason you wanted, you could also address from four through seven and that would be an alias. So we've lost some potential I.O. space, but not very much, just four locations. And we're getting this because all of the various other address pins that we're using in our address decoding logic need to be set to zero. All right, so we've started a memory map.